Welcome to Face to Facts. It's good to have you all here once again. I am Nick Face. Happy October. As the weather gets a little colder and more rain and all kinds of depressing, nasty colors outside. Uh, we have a lot to talk about because we have we weren't with you the last time when the Patriots took on the box with Tom Brady returning. So we got to recap all that fun stuff. We have a wild one this evening coming up against the Red Sox and the Yankees. Um, no, I hate telling you when these shows are taped, but it's the night uh, to, uh, prior to the baseball, uh, the big wild card game between the Red Sox and the Yankees. Winner advances to the division series. So we'll talk about our expectations on that. We have the Celtics who started their preseason uh, this week, and we'll talk about how the team looked and everything. The Bruins have are also in an ex exhibition mode with their getting ready for their season, which will be starting soon. Everything's kind of uh, in motion here from everything. I am going to um, have Phil and Tom uh, just introduce themselves and we'll start talking. I want to go first with the Patriots and the box and how everything went from there. So first things first, Phil, how are you? Hey, Nick, I'm doing all right. Uh, hanging in there. And Tom, how are you doing? Uh, doing great, you know. Uh, it's all good, Tom. Uh, doing good. Um, excited for the hockey season to get started, so that'll be good. Now I'm unmuted. So this is our first show that we're doing where um, Tom has joined um, our sports zone team full time. So we're excited about that. So we're kind of both in the same room here. I'm in one spot, I'm sitting in one corner and Tom's in the other corner in our temper tantrum spot. Um, this is also the first um, show that I have ever done, very sadly to say with, um, had to put our family dog Jake down on Friday. So if I don't seem the same lively, upbeat kind of person that I kind of always am on the show, I'm doing the best I can. So it's, um, it's going to be a big time adjustment. Um, it's very hard to lose an animal. I don't want this to be a depressing show with anything, but he, um, many people know that that was my little sidekick. So he's missed. And unfortunately, as I've learned in this life, life goes on. Life goes on. Um, let's kick it off first here with the Patriots and our Bucks. Assuming you both watch the game. So I want to go over to Tom first, just kind of expectations on how you thought everything went and uh, just kind of a basic recap. Um, I think, I mean, couldn't have asked for a better effort from Mac Jones really against uh, a defense. That I would say added a little boost to them with the Richard Sherman signing and everything. Um, I don't know what this, who else this team really needs to, you know, make themselves better. But um, I mean, it would have been a romping for sure if uh, Gronk wasn't hurt and was playing in that game. But uh, props to Mac Jones. Um, I think he looked better than what a lot of people would have expected against uh, Tom Brady and the rest of the Buccaneers and that offense and the defense. So uh, fairly happy with what happened other than the decision at the end of the game. But other than that, uh, it wasn't bad. Oh, to Phil. Um... What was your overall take from the game? Not very similar to what Tom was saying. I think uh, I, I actually think Sherman was up and down. He hadn't played in some time. He had been injured. But I, like their secondary, the Bucks secondary was pretty uh, totaled. But you know their their interior defense, their defense overall was pretty good. Um, we couldn't run the ball. That's a big problem. Uh, the offensive line for the Patriots is still a huge issue, it seems. But Mac Jones, like. You, you couldn't tell really uh, that he was, if he was bothered or not that much. I mean, sure, they got to him 
handful of times, but he got the ball out and he made some passes that I was like, oh, he like that seemed effortless, but were like in tight, tight windows. And you know who came out a little bit uh, during this game? Hunter Henry. And I, you could say Judon uh, as uh, one of our uh, better linebackers, but I think he's been there the whole time being pretty good. This is just him. I think he's just accelerating as each game goes on. And Bill Belichick or whoever is running the defense, I think it maybe it was more of a Bill Belichick called game, but he, uh, he flummoxed Tom Brady. Uh, whether you think Tom Brady was too hyped on the motion or just was having an off night, I think he legit was being countered by successfully countered by uh, the play calling, defensive play calling. And yeah, Mac Jones, like I was an entertaining game, very entertaining. Uh, things are back and forth. It was low scoring, but it felt like it was kind of a grind it out, but it's just like, yep. Uh, same thing. Like why not just have Mac Jones try for that fourth and three? That's all. So I, I have to echo the same kind of statement there from Phil. I think Matt Judon has been the best free agent signing for the Patriots so far this season from what we've seen. Solidified that linebacker core. He got to Brady a few times. Brady landed on his butt. Um, I've been very happy with his play. I like I like Hunter Henry. I think uh, John U. Smith has been a no-show, basically. He's done absolutely nothing. You know, and I will say that um, overall, the Patriots, yes, they're one in three but they don't feel like a one and three team. I'm very pleased with what I've seen with Mac Jones. I must say, I like his poise. I like how he's worked with the system that's been given to him. I think under pressure, we need to work on a couple different things. I don't think it's all his fault. I think our offensive line has completely sucked. I think a call to Dante Scarnecchia is needed because the line right now is just, it's, it's, abysmal a lot of injuries a lot of unknowns from everything going on with stuff a lot of versatility issues they need to figure that that whole effort out there but i have to say my biggest takeaway here was obviously the story with tom brady me going into this game i have to say for the very first time it really didn't matter to me who who won or lost this game i'm a, one of the biggest tom brady fans on the face of the earth he gave a lot to this New England Patriots team and organization. If he won, great. If Patriots won, that's great too. That being said, the Patriots definitely should have won this game because Brady was absolutely outplayed. Mac Jones outplayed Tom Brady. I can truthfully tell you that with a straight face. Mac Jones was poised. He was prepared. He should have won this game. No question about it. I blame the coaching staff for the horrible decision that was made on fourth and three. And here's why. You do not go for that kick with 56, 56 yards. I do not blame Nick Falk in the least bit. The kick never should have been made. What should have been done right there is you should have went for it. You are not going to win this game with that field goal if it's made. You are not. You are putting Tom Brady back on that field with 58 seconds to go. And I'm sorry, he's at least tying that game. There is no no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I think he had a timeout. I think he had a timeout, too. Yeah. Patriots also burned a timeout in that last minute of play, basically, because Chase Winovich was an understanding of whatever play call was being made. So they had to burn a timeout there to take one off the board. So two timeouts there would have made a probably a big factor there, too. But that last drive, I know the rain was coming down. I hate blaming weather as an issue right there, but Mac Jones didn't look that great in that last possession right there of that drive down the field. We also got very lucky on that drive because the refs missed an offsides call on Isaiah Wynn. So we really shouldn't have even been in a field goal per se kind of opportunity, if you know what I mean. I still am baffled why they went for it on fourth and three, though. That's my biggest takeaway from this game because you played a very, very good game. Why that play call was made, I don't, I don't get it. Even if you, again, say you miss it on fourth and three, okay, you lose the game. But if you go and you get it, you got to take more time off the clock. You cannot put Tom Brady back in the field. Heck, even if he had 15 seconds, you cannot put him back on the field to try and win a game because he's going to do it. 
You can't second guess that right there. So I, 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 I'm, I'm baffled. I'm baffled beyond. I'm baffled beyond words on why they went for it. But, um, it's probably the the first time ever where yes, a loss is a loss and it, it stings. But I think you learned a little bit more about what this team is. I think you learned more about what to expect and how this team is probably still going to be in postseason discussion as this year goes on. I mean, coming up next, you got Houston. I know you can't take any opponent lightly, but if you really don't win that game against the Texans, pack it up, pack it up. You're done. So ideally, hopefully by the end of next week, we're two and three and we're on the up and up. Um, anybody else have anything to add? Uh, I will say that, um, yeah, I mean, even though, you, you know, you can't blame folk for that because he was, he missed by inches. Like he literally hit the bottom corner of the, the field goal post. Like he missed by inches. That was astonishing. Um, which, you know, two years ago really when wins. they first signed him, you wouldn't have thought that would happen. <laughs> um, and, you know, you're seeing a lot of improvement in uh, Mac Jones's game with each and every game. Um, and Sunday was definitely an improvement from game against the Saints, a major, major improvement. The defense stepped it up again. Um, for the most part, Brady looked awful in the first quarter. I can't remember the last time I've seen him look that bad. Um, and, you know, like Phil said, we had a tough time getting the running game going. Um, and they're running – the Buccaneers running game was going pretty well to start, and then it kind of just – it kind of flip-flopped a little bit. Um, but definitely a lot more passing going on in that game, which is what we like to see. Um, not too many uh, deep passes this week. Um, so still would want to like to see more of that. Um you know, in the next next few games. Um, but all, all in all, definitely an improvement from the game against the Saints. Yeah, I, uh, nope. I'm i with you there. Uh, the Nick Folk, like, kick, it's just like, what? You're going to make him kick 56 yards in the rain? Nick Folk? And even if he was healthy or, like, prime Nick Folk, like, I think he said, like, he only made, like, a 55 or 57-yarder, and it was, like, years ago. Like one of them, and you know he's not known as his clutch kicker either. Um, so yeah, I I mean, and I was listening to takes on it, and I get it. And the first thing I thought in my head is like, oh, he kind of doesn't want for this to fall on Mac Jones's shoulder. Like he's weird, he's weirdly protecting him. And to me, I don't, I can see how that can be beneficial, but I also in my head I'm like, well, when's he gonna, you know, when are you get, when are you gonna throw him in front of it? in front of that, uh, waiting to throw him in the pool and let him swim. And he, they kind of did, <clears throat> honestly, they kind of did uh, that night, that game. They let him throw it like 42 times. But also they didn't have a choice because they weren't really running it. Um, but, yeah, to Tom's point, yeah, they, they they didn't really throw downfield that much. The only people who did, well, the only person who did was uh, Jacoby Myers, who also, once again, like him and Kendrick Bourne, not bad uh, duo, receiving duo. They might not be the – you know, the explosive ones you have, but they're great. Jacoby Myers, Myers, every time, like, he gets to the ball, it's a first down, it seems, or at least, like, you know, he very rarely loses uh, track of ball or, you know, doesn't catch a ball. So, I don't know. I, I really like uh, Myers. One of the things that I liked on the Jacoby Myers, I'm glad you brought his name up, was the little trick play that was there. You know, the little trickery right there where he threw back and was able to connect with, uh, was it? I think it was born. On, on I think it was Agu away. Aguilar on the sidelines. That's when they made it to the ten. Yeah, that's a. Uh, well, he did it a couple times, I think. Right. One to Bolden and one to right. One to Bolden and one to Aguilar. What might have been that? Yeah, I think they did it once, but it was really nice to see. You know, a little bag of tricks that the Patriots always have that in the back of their mind from everything. Let's talk about the whole Brady treatment with everything, because this is. Again, this was built up as the return. And there were a lot of things that I think a lot of people were anticipated about. Obviously, Brady coming back for the first time since 2019, basically. And I was excited for it. 
but we also got that opportunity to hear and to see some things that if you're a fan, you should be very happy about. So one of those things was part of this community for a long time when he is done playing. So he also talked about maybe there's not being it for uh, finishing his career with the Bucks, And what a, what, a, what a lot of hype and speculation that leads to is maybe when he finally is done, he's going to sign that one day contract to retire officially as a Patriot. So um, there also was that 24 minute after the game, a uh, little uh, meeting with Bill and Tom that there's still a lot of rumblings about what was said, what was done and everything right there. So I want to open it up to you guys and have a discussion about what was that little one-on-one -on -one meeting where Bill snuck into the uh, locker room at the end of the game about. Um, a lot of grunting, uh, a lot of, you know, tobacco spitting. Oh, Tom, are you muted? Uh, he was talking to Kraft. He was talking to a lot of the players that he played with, but there was no camera action of him talking to Bill. And I don't know if, you know, they were just going to wait until after the game or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, it should be interesting to see what, what turns out from that. Um, I also want to mention too, that, you know, not going for the kicking the field goal and not going for it on fourth and three isn't very Bill Belichick esque of him, um, which was very surprising. Um, and also with the running game being so lack, um, lacking in that game, I think it's because they weren't really expecting Mac Jones to be throwing the ball a lot. Um, but yeah, back to Bill and Tom. Um, I'm surprised Bill was even, you know, allowed in the Tampa Bay locker room or whatever. Uh, so that's kind of surprising to hear because I didn't even hear about that. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry. Um, the, he was very short with Mac Jones with what he said to Mac Jones, which is kind of surprising, honestly. Um, you know, given the type of guy that Brady is, I know he like never Mac or anything, but he, I think a lot of people would have expected a lot more of Brady, of what uh, Brady would say to him. Well, that's because Mac Jones was a Peyton Manning and Mike Vick fan back in the day. He wasn't a Tom Brady fan. I don't know if you knew that. Had big no, fat hands know. up in his bedroom. Brady wasn't Very part bizarre. of that. I also think that it's a it's an ego thing with Brady too. I think he doesn't really want to go out of his way for the next, you know, so-called successor because again, that's was his team. So I think that that's what that whole uh, charade is about right there. I think that, um, you know, it's not personal or anything. I just think it's a, it's a, it's a sentimental kind of feel to Brady and everything right there too. I, I do have to uh, speculate here a little bit about what that meeting might've been about. And I think that there's a lot of smoke and a lot of fun and a, a, just a lot of smoke towards the media with this Brady and Belichick, all they hate each other kind of thing. I don't really think that's what it is. I think Bill is a lot gruffer and a lot tougher than he really looks. And I think there's a lot of speculation that's out there about some sort of internal feud that's gone on between the two. I think deep down, Bill has a, a big appreciation of everything that Tom Brady is and was. I think it was tough for Bill to have to move forward. I still think at the end of the day, Bill is, was still shocked when Brady didn't come back and rework some sort of contract out. I think that he had to go searching for that next person, which was Cam Newton. I don't think he wanted that. I think he tried his best to put on a, a, a face and basically say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Truthfully, I think if Bill could have this back, I think he would have Brady back, truthfully. I really do. Look at the record. Look at the record. It speaks for itself right now. Bill can't win without Tom Brady right now. I hope it changes. Time will tell. But right now, I think if Bill had it his way, Brady is still his quarterback. That's my take. Might be a hot take. Take it for what it is. Well, there was a great – one last thing I'll say about the Belichick-Brady thing. 
in the uh, post game press conference, uh, there uh, that obligatory question was asked to Belichick. What was it like to finally face Tom Brady? And Belichick kind of, you know, as he does, he kind of scoffs at it. Goes, we used to face him all the time in practice. And I was like, oh yeah, of course. Like Don on Marblehead, yeah, he's all this whole time, like his whole career has been going against and plotting against him. And not only that, like players like Devin McCourty, Matthew Slater, uh, even Hightower, and other uh, defensive people, people still there, Dietrich Wise. Uh, he when he played with them, you had to play against them. I mean, that's what practice was. But it's just the whole thing. And who knows? Yeah, in the locker room, maybe they were just like talking about like, hey, shoot, shooting the shooting the breeze about <clears throat> you know the heydays and just like how things have been. Because yeah, I think I think there's a lot of heat heat between them as far as like not hatred, but just kind of competitiveness. And who knows if they even like really like met that long in the, who knows if, you know, maybe it's just a PR stunt, but uh, to say that they were, but it, I imagine they, they will always have begrudging respect for one another because they won six championships together, whether or not you can say one was more valuable than the next. 20 years. You can't flush 20 years down the toilet and say, bye-bye. You can't. There's a lot of credit. There's a lot of appreciation for the both of them. Let's be honest here. This was strictly a business decision. Is it a horrible business decision right now for the Patriots? Absolutely. But hopefully that, that little bit of pain that's been there since Brady's left with Mac Jones, if that's the future and everything right there, it might be starting to turn a corner. And I'm saying starting because you have to put the brakes on here. You're never going to get what you had. You're never going to get that again. But you can get bits and pieces as time goes on and more experience is gained with Mac under center. So we'll see how that all flows and goes. I know for me, I thoroughly enjoyed the game with everything. And I still tip my cap to Brady. I am still, I am still the Brady camp. I am not the Belichick camp. I give Brady the credit for those championships because it takes the player to execute. The coach is there to call the plays. Yes, I'm giving Belichick credit, but if there's no Brady there, you do not win all those six championships. So I'm not saying I'm, a, I'm all box, but I'm saying that I can root for the box and I can root for the Patriots as well too. I also I also want to mention that it's um well one that there were a lot of Brady jerseys there at the game whether it was the split jerseys the Tampa jerseys the Patriots jerseys um and uh, we we were forgetting to mention that Brady has now beat every single football team at Gillette Stadium which how many times do you actually see in a lifetime really No, you never see that. So that was another thing. And, and then, of course, we have to mention the all-time passing record being broken. How can we forget that? They didn't really stop the game for it. Like they said they were going to do. You know, it is what it is from it. But it was kind of interesting how Drew Brees, who's now a, an, an analyst for NBC, was on house to witness that, too. I'm sure that was a little bit of a tough kind of situation to be in right there. But, you know, it is what it is from that. Um Anything else anybody wants to add on the Patriots? Because I do want to move over to the wild card champagne popping Red Sox. <laughs> All right. I want to talk about the Red Sox because guess what? They are the leader of the wild card. So big game going on this evening between the Red Sox and Yankees. We'll kick off at eight. Well, can't really kick off. We will play ball at eight o'clock this evening at Fenway Park. It's been a tug of war battle this season. I know that at the beginning of this year, they started 0-3 against the Orioles. And if someone came up to me at the beginning of the season and said that they're going to be in the wild card, they're going to win 92 or 90, 93 wins, I would say I'll take that any day, of the, any day of the week. And that is true. But the way we got here is really kind of 
bugs me a bit because this team has had its great moments. It has had its rock bottom moments. It has had its absolute torturous wins or losses this year. So gun to my head tonight, I can still not tell you who is going to win this game. I have no feeling. I'm like numb about it because <laughs> I have no freaking clue which team is going to show up here tonight. Anybody else feeling how I'm feeling? That's the question for which uh, that would be for both because they both have equally sucked. The <laughs> they're so identical, it's scary. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to come down to which team has more heart, really. Um, it's going to be kind of wild. I don't know. It's it's going to be a wild wild card game. Uh, to you know, no pun intended, but um, Too many I mean, guns. it's going to be at Fenway, so. Uh -huh. Hopefully that's gonna do a little bit for the Red Sox, um, but yeah, I mean, it all depends on which team shows up for both teams. I mean, the Yankees have been on a on a downslope. The Red Sox have been on a roller coaster the last month, so um, so it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, well, I don't one particular players. player who tripped over second base on Sunday's game is not playing in the lineup. That is, yeah, I was Martinez, so who tripped over, yes, tripped mm -hmm. over second base and sprained his freaking ankle is not playing tonight because he's made of Legos. So, yeah, it. it's already starting off. And uh, what's his name? Uh, Chris Sale is scratch. Zoom and gloom over here. You know, it's well, not. <laughs> well, look at it this way, too. Like, it, the weird, to your point and to Tom's point, like, it's so bizarre. Like, the Yankees, you know, they swept that series last week. And you're like, all right, here we go again. And then all of a sudden, they like, what do they lose? Like, the next, like, three out of four or whatever. Like, they, like, screw the pooch. And uh, as soon as, as you know, you take you take a minute or that a couple of days go by. Like, wait, the Sox are ahead. After like they, there was like almost uh, there was a chance we could have had a four way tie for like uh, two wild card spots, which would have been mad. We would have had a game last night, and or a play in game for the play in game. That would have been uh, the Blue Jays, I think, or the Mariners. But the yeah. Mariners got that Blues in the you know, the Red Sox stormed the hearts of the Blue Jays on Sunday. <laughs> so uh, I was scared. I'm to tell you the truth. I'll be completely honest with you guys. I was absolutely petrified if we had to play a one game against the Blue Jays. The Blue Jays scare me more than the Yankees. They really do. I don't know how you feel about that, uh, guys, but that's just my, was my overall take. That lineup and how that pitching staff performed, especially second half of the season, I didn't want to mess with that. Yeah, I mean, the only real saving grace uh, – of the whole thing was that the Red Sox had the tiebreaker with all three teams in the race, really. Um, by one game. Yeah, by one game. So, I mean, I mean, if we lost, we still would have basically been guaranteed in, but, you know, I don't want to really want to take that risk. And you, you'd rather have home field advantage anyway for the wild card game. So, um, Hopefully, you know, the bats that are hot right now can stay hot. Uh, Christian Vasquez maybe will come up clutch again. No, he's not playing. Of course. Of course he's not playing tonight. <laughs> so, you know, what's it? You know, the guy that's been clutch the last three, four games, whatever it's been, you know, let's sit him on the bench. Whatever. We'll, we'll pinch one. hit him. He had one, just one. Uh, he, he had two. He had he had the one the, the game before the final game of the season. Then he had that one big hit in the final game of the season. So the big hit came from Verdugo on Sunday night with that bases clearing double to tie at five five, and then I believe Kiki Kike Hernandez hit a hit a home run to help captivate two run home run. I I was I crapped all over Kiki at the beginning of the season. I did. I'll be completely honest with you, and I have to tell you, he's one of. He's probably one of my favorite people that's in the lineup and on the team as of now. He really came up and he really showed that he's a spark and he's very versatile. I mean, he's been center field, second base. He made one of the best second base plays. I think it was Saturday night 
or Friday night's game against the Nationals. Without that, I don't think they would have won one of their, their games. I really like I hope I hope he's back. I hope he's back for next year because um, I really I think that he's he's become a real staple and a real part of this team. We also have to give credit to probably the best free agent signing of the offseason, the best bargain of the year, Hunter Renfro. I mean, my God, was that guy amazing this year. He had close to 100 RBIs, close to 30 home runs. That was absolutely unheard of. He has got better number. He bets. I know it's a different, you know, you can't really compare Mookie to Hunter Renfro, but that was a great signing. The Schwarber deal. Everybody wanted Anthony Rizzo. Everybody wanted him. I'm guilty of it. Bat-wise, that was a much needed, uh, much needed addition to the team. And I will say, especially for a game like tonight where JD Martinez is out, you get Schwarber in that lineup. You'll probably see Dahlbeck or Travis Shaw at first base. I mean, imagine this team without Schwarber or a JD Martinez in your lineup. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to mess that you can't. I mean, you go nowhere. You go nowhere from it. So I want to say that because we're at Fenway Park, we have the advantage. I am happy that Evaldi is the one that's starting. Evaldi, over his career, has typically pitched great games against the Yankees. He had a clunker in his last uh, his last uh, start against, I think it was the Orioles or some, or right around there. So, no, but Evaldi is like a Yankee killer. You're Evaldi right. was pretty good against, I think he threw against the Nationals um, this past weekend, if I'm correct. I can't remember. On. No, he did not. No, he did not. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He did not. Um, it was against the Orioles. He did not have such a great start from that game, but I think he's going to bounce back well with this. I think he rises to the occasion, especially playoffs. Just remember 2018 against the Dodgers when he came out and threw that uh, tremendous performance um, in the postseason for them. So if uh, if luck is turning on me, because it's been a very, very bad last week, it's good that this is a new week here. I will remain hopeful that the Red Sox can get the job done here tonight. And if they get the job done, they'll be taking on the Rays Thursday night in Tampa. And I must say, Yes, the Rays were the division leaders. I, I don't know how they do it because player-wise, the Red Sox have better player-wise, better players than what the Rays have. I, 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 I think that the Red Sox could pull it out against the Rays, especially if they get hot at the right time. So uh, my only other thing I am going to say on the Red Sox front is what I was a little bit ticked off with and a little disappointed with. And Tom already knows because I made a little bit of a joke earlier down today here at the office. So the Red Sox are, you know, your wild card playing team. They're playing against the Yankees. Did that deserve a champagne celebration in the locker room on Sunday? Just curious on what your take is here. Both of you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, you did. You're playing in the wild card game. You uh, had a mess of an end of the season, actually second half, really. Um, and you know, you you get a guaranteed spot in the wild card to try to get into the playoffs. So I mean, it's something. Um, Got to give them credit. You know, where credits due, they came through in the end. Um, it's not a guaranteed playoff spot, but hey, it you know we got we got somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll agree with Tom there. I understand where you're coming from, Nick. Um, because, I, I, you know, it's like, uh, who cares? It's a playing game. It's not like you're not in the playoffs. But, I mean, hell, this is extra baseball. They made it, you know, they made it the, the additional step. And a lot of these players have weren't on the team when they made it uh, to the World Series a couple of years ago. And I, and I can see, like, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh my god, I can't, I don't know why I can't remember the, the manager at the moment, Alex Cora. Uh, I can see Cora being like, all right, settle down, guys. Uh, we, you know, act like you've been here before. But you know what? At, at some point, you got to be like, hey, you guys, you swept the nationals, you kind of weathered the storm of the whole year, and they had a crazy August, and they kind of stormed back in September. I mean, yeah, they earned it. They earned this kind of like little celebration here. And I, I definitely understand because I'm, I'm from that old school a bit too of like, well, we'll break up the champagne when you win something or you move to like the ALCS or something. Um, 
but you know what? Uh, yeah, why not? I mean, yeah. Surprisingly, I'm going to agree with all three of you here. Remember, I just made a statement. I just made a statement. I'm just you owe just, just you owe dog you. You tricked us. I actually agree with this because it's been hell in the past. You know, 2020 was a horrible year. We all know that. 2019, they didn't get go anywhere. This Red Sox team, as frustrating and everything as they have, as they have been, think about all the different things they've had to go. Through. Mute me. I have lots to say. <laughs> the one thing that I will say that that really I think that this was a good thing for them to do, and I and I I thought about it a little bit, and I have to agree here with Alex Cora on it. This is a great morale booster for this team. Great morale booster as for a team that really needed it and to get a jump start. I think that this right here was the right move to make considering the COVID scares and the players that had to come and go. And, you know, you basically had an express train between the Woo Sox and Fenway Park going back and forth with all these different players and pitchers used throughout the year. You had Chris Sale down for the good first half of the season. You get him back as the boost. You didn't really have any additions that you could have for the bullpen for much outside of Robles and Austin Davis, who have actually come in and done pretty decent. This was the right move to make. And I'm surprised at myself for saying it because I'm such a traditionalist. I am such a person who typically is like, you didn't win shit. Why the hell are you going out and you doing anything? I think that this was the right move to make. And if that is a spark or a get the wheel kind of turning in, in a good sort of morale boost to this team, good job to Alex Cora. But if they lose tonight, I'm going to be tuning. I'm going to be. Uh, I'm going to be speaking a different tune about it. But right now, um, I, I feel that that was the right move to make. So we are three for three agreeing on something. The world's going to end. <laughs> Anything else you want to add? Any predictions for tonight? Are you going Red Sox, Yankees? What do What do we do? We're going to be going to be three for three here with our vote. Let's see. No, I think I think the Red Sox will take it. I think they will have the edge. I think being in Fenway will move the needle. And I think Nathan Navaldi, going back to that, as my two little dogs are bi- battling each other, I apologize at my feet uh, and plotting against me. But uh, I think they're Yankees fans. But uh, Nathan Navaldi, yeah, he's that guy. Uh, he is that guy. He's a Yankee killer, and he's pitched for you for us for the Red Sox. In crazy situations. And I think Alex Cora, I trust him as a manager to kind of like it's do or die. I think he's going to definitely, he's going to make a better decision than most managers. And I, I think you guys, I think you said it, Nick, pretty well. That was a morale booster, not only to get into the, uh, the wild card playing game, but to host it and to kind of earn the right to host it and, uh, you know, win all these tiebreakers and just survive. And I think they know how to survive. I think that's a mark of a good, good team, a good playoff team. I'm a survivor. No, don't need to sing here anymore on, on our episode here. But I, I totally agree with you, Phil. Totally, totally agree on that. Uh, Tom, do you have a te- do you have a uh, prediction for tonight? Because I'm thinking revenge of 1978 is what I'm thinking tonight. Um, yeah, I think the, I think the Red Sox will, uh, you know, pull it out. Like we said, of all these, the Yankee killer, um, when it all comes down to it, he's the guy we want on the mound. Um, you know, the game, the game of all games right now, you got to take it one game at a time, uh, and just focus on beating the Yankees and Evaldi's going to have a huge morale booster. If he pitches well tonight, um, utilize as many guys as you need to, uh, and make sure you just, you know, play the game, be smart, uh, and just play like you have the last three games of the season, really. I think it's going to be a close one here for the Red Sox here tonight, but I got something in my head for numbers wise, and I keep getting five to two as the as the number for tonight. So I think the Red Sox will win five to two. 
I think that that's what we'll see here tonight. It's going to be a nail after this one tonight. It's just kind of how the season is gone. So bite your nails. Just don't do your toenails. That's kind of disgusting. But I think I think we get the win here tonight, and we're going to be heading to Tampa come Thursday. That's my overall expectation. That's how I'm feeling right now. Hopefully I'm right. I'd like to be right. Um, I know time-wise, I'd love to get into, you know, our Celtics. I'm just going to mention them quick. They had a great start. I'm sure Phil got a chance to watch. They look rejuvenated. They look energized. I think that the response from our new coach is going to be, I think there's going to be a lot of liking and buying into the Celtics this year. I do. No, I think you're there. And just a quick thing. I keep forgetting that's a new coach. Uh, which is very odd, isn't it, when you think about it? Because it's like, oh, yeah, because Brad Stevens isn't gone. He's still in the organization. But, yeah, no, I didn't catch all of it. I only caught some highlights. But, yeah, I – and Dennis Schroeder, or Schroeder. Uh, yeah, he's he'll, he's going to distribute that ball, and he's going to be all over the court. And you just they just need to shore up their uh, interior defense, and I think uh, there'll be a problem for a lot of teams. Uh, Tom, the last thing I was going to mention, the Bruins are wrapping up their exhibition. Uh, they have one more game this upcoming Wednesday against the Capitals. Jack Studnicka is going to be a member on one of these lines here for the Bruins, ideally the third or fourth. Is that a true or false statement? Um. If anything, if at all, it'll probably be the fourth line. It'll probably be the fourth line center. Uh, I'm excited for the hockey season to get started. I am going to the Bruins home opener on uh, October 16th, so looking forward to that. Um, I'm hoping Jeremy Swayman's the starting goalie after what I saw from Allmark in the preseason game. Uh oh, Tom, we're losing you a bit. Uh oh, we're losing Tom. Come I'm back, Tom. I'm a little frozen at the moment. So as soon as he comes back, we'll be able to uh, hear his final take. But the, the general gist of it, oh, Tom is back. Maybe. Go ahead. Um, where did I cut out? I'm frozen again. About the goaltending. About, yeah. Oh. All right. So, yeah. Um, Hopefully Swayman is the starter for the season because um, Allmark made the worst play ever for a, an experience. I wouldn't say veteran goalie, but an experienced goalie um, to lose the game in overtime against the Rangers in the preseason game. Um, so I'm really hoping that Swayman is the starter. That's that was what our hope was uh, once we found out Rask would not be uh, starting the season off with the Bruins. Um and since Vladar went elsewhere. Um, oh, we're losing again, Tom. Only thing I'm just going to add right there is Swayman should be in the net come opening night. He is your number one. Linus, who needs his blanket to survive, Omark, is – a backup. I'm sorry. He's a backup. You paid an overpriced goaltender to be your backup. That's what it's going to end up being. And the other hot take here is that, yes, Tuka Rask will be back second half of this season. Could be sooner. I guess he's rehabbing well. He's rehabbing with the team. There's no contract or anything there. But Linus Elmark might be down to Providence. Might, might, he might become the Rusny Castillo of the hockey world. Hot take. Take it or leave it. Oh, what a name drop. What a horrible name drop. My God. <laughs> All right. We talked about a lot here on this episode. Uh, go Patriots against Houston. Go Red Sox against the Yankees. Let's get to Tampa. And hopefully we will see you again next time here on another episode of Face Facts. Uh, we will see you next time. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>